Welcome back, everyone. This is Steel Politics Tonight. And Dr. Kabir Adamu, a security expert and managing director of Econ Consulting Limited, is still uh, with us on the program as we focus on the continued killings in Plateau State. Dr. Adamu, thank you so much for staying with us. Now, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, Tajuddin Abbas, has reacted to uh, this recent attack. It says, upon resumption next Tuesday, uh, the House of Reps will hold a security summit. What are your expectations? Okay, first off, and um, with due respect to the Speaker of House of Reps, um, I don't think what we need at the moment is a security summit. Uh, I am aware that uh, the National Assembly has held several security summits. Um, I, by virtue of a role I played um, in the 9th National Assembly, uh, participated in one of such summits. His, um, uh, um, his peer then, on the 9th Assembly, who is the current Chief of Staff, also um, headed uh, and um, you know, co um, chaired one of the security summits that was held in the National Assembly. And I can tell you that it, there is no lack of knowledge of what the issues are mm -hmm. as far as national security is concerned in Nigeria. So instead of, um, for lack of a better word, wasting taxpayers' money in holding a summit, I think what is important is to come up with an implementation strategy. In other words, you could um, come up with an ad hoc committee of um, especially leadership of the various committees that have responsibility for security to tell them to harmonize previous um, recommendations and reports that those committees have uh, or, or, or those um, you know, conferences that were held by the National Assembly. And then to now find out, because I know that at the end of those um, conferences, um, recommendations and um, in, some, in some instances, the National Assembly actually sat, sat on, on them and then, um, you know, uh, deliberated and then, you know, submitted uh, outcomes and positions which were taken to the executive arm of government. So what would probably be useful to Nigerians and value for money, or the money we don't even have at the moment, is to identify which of those recommendations have so far been implemented. Uh, why were they not implemented? What is the role of the National Assembly in ensuring um, the implementation of some of the recommendations? Because the reality is that some of these recommendations require constitutional change. Uh, as an example, everybody in Nigeria at the moment, um, well, not everybody, a lot of us in Nigeria at the moment are calling for state policy. That requires some level of constitutional change. This is a no-brainer. Um, another one that is also a no-brainer is the, co the Commission for Small Arms and Light Weapons. It is shocking that um, almost, I think about, um, if, I, if I'm right, almost 15 years or thereabout, that ECOWAS has recommended each of its member states to have a Commission for Small Arms and Light Weapons. Until date, we do not have a functional Commission. What we have is one that is operating, I think, illegally, that is claiming um, he's, he, they are waiting for a presidential ac accent, but then still have an office, have collected monies from people, and, and I think perhaps they should even be interrogated. Uh, and then the other one that is a center um, that is operating under the office of the National Security Advisor. But what we need, um, given the proliferation of small arms and light people in Nigeria, is a commission just like has been recommended in ECOWAS and that all other 14 ECOWAS member states. And that role and responsibility is in the National Assembly to engage with the president and encourage the president, convince him to have that, that commission. So again, there are so many of these points that I can lift mm. that instead of holding a, a conference, um, that should be done. The second thing I think is also absolutely important is perhaps to strengthen the committees on security. I, by virtue of the fact that I've engaged with National Assembly, I know that those committees need capacity uh, be, um, development. Uh, security is not just anybody's, uh, you know, market as, as it were to go in. You, the persons have been appointed as chairman of committees with responsibility for oversight on security. But frankly, in my honest opinion, they need their capacity to be developed. So perhaps in, instead of using that money, send them on trainings, engage uh, practitioners with expertise that can help train them so that the, the oversight role that they play when during the oversight functions that they do would be better in terms of the out outcome. Um, I, I want to really emphasize this. 
the drivers of insecurity in Nigeria, all those things that make people um, commit um, crime, you know, the poverty level, name them. No other agency of government has a role to reduce that like the National Assembly. If they play their role and ensure that the budget is implemented um, in the manner that it's been set out, you know, and corruption is reduced in the entire process. Perhaps we'll have power. Perhaps our infrastructure will flow better. Perhaps um, small and medium scale industries would um, function better. And that means some of the drivers of insecurity will be, will, will be addressed at their root causes. Our local government system that is not working, the National Assembly plays its role. So my point is, and, and with due respect to him, we don't need a conference. We know what the problem is implement the recommendations of pre uh, previous um, conferences that have been held at the National Assembly and save taxpayers' money. Right. Dr. Damu, I find your points very instructive and crucial because I remember after uh, the December massacre on the plateau, the Senate summoned heads of military and security over that attack, while the House of Reps also called for a probe and was still holding on and waiting for positive results on that. But then, recently you've advocated for restorative and transformative justice. How will this restore peace on the plateau? And please correct me if I'm wrong. Restorative justice means dialogue. Don't you think this has been explored again and again? Um, so uh, let me start with the first part of your question, the invitation by uh, the parliament. Um, to an extent, the parliamentary style we have in Nigeria was brought from the U.S. with contraptions here and there. Uh, in my honest opinion, and I haven't seen that in the United States, yes, par parliamentary inquiries are done um, in a very professional manner. Uh, in other words, if the, any of the security forces are coming to the parliament, they're G3 because the parliament is prepared. The kind of questions that the parliament would ask them, the outcomes of those inquiries would even cause them to lose their job. That's not what we have in Nigeria. Um, we have um, you know, sessions that are merely, uh, you know, largely political, actually, where questions are asked without depth, and then, you know, they, are, they, they, they leave. Um, we need more than that. Earlier on, when I spoke about improving the capacity uh, of the um, committees, um, I'm, I'm very serious about it. If they don't know the questions to ask, then perhaps you know the, the, the sessions will be one where um, the outcome would not be useful to uh, to anyone. So I'm hoping that that type of invitation would even reduce. We don't need it. Uh, what we need is better oversight functions. And if they continue with the oversight functions, I'm hoping that um, they would do not even need those in invitations. Because remember that for every period they go, they visit this ministries, departments, and agencies, they engage with them. And that is where those technical and critical questions is. Only when there are serious issues, for instance, the bombing that happened in Kaduna, the, you know, um, that perhaps we see those type of parliamentary inquiries, and then they invite um, you know, the, the particular security department that was responsible for that. But for the type of invitation that I've seen, I, I honestly don't think it's necessary. It's, it's, not, it's not useful as far as I'm concerned um, to mm -hmm. the nation. With regards to um, the second part of your question, um, both um, transformative, um, restorative and transformative justice, yes, it's to a larger extent, it's about dialogue. But more importantly, it's also about peace building. The essence of this, uh, that type of justice is to um, allow the two communities to air their grievances. Up until today, I can bet you, if you invite um, certain elements within the plateau state government, they will still tell you that the harder communities are killing for killing sake. Now, you would never have restorative justice if you continue to isolate a particular um, community, irrespective of whether that grievance is logical or not. Invite them. Listen to them. If it's illogical, explain to them. Allow them to convince themselves that it's, it is illogical. Uh, but give them a listening ear. Um, allow them to hear whatever grievance that they, that they have. They are burying their deaths. If, if you are uh, following up developments, you'll find out that they are also being killed. you find out that their property is also being destroyed. So they also need to be allowed to hear their grievances. The two sides need to come together and accept the fact that they've done enough courage, courage to themselves. The killings is a killing on both sides. The destruction of properties on both sides. Now, uh, will they forgive themselves? Or they, do they need some ty types of um, compensation for what has been lost? That's what the government would need to mm. decide. 
if the decision is to forgive themselves, like the immediate past government attempted to do when he publicly sought for forgiveness from all persons of Plati State, perhaps that, that's the channel to go. So it's a little bit more than um, dialogue. It requires acceptance of fault. It requires um, either compensation or forgiveness, as the case may be. And then it, it requires a pact, you know, a well-documented pact by both sides to say, okay, what has happened in the past um, on the basis of either forgiveness or compensation would be, you know, we've passed that stage. We're not going to revisit it again. And the new phase that we're going to open is a phase where peace building will be living together, just like we lived together in the past, um, respecting each other's differences, respecting each other's, um, you know, inclinations, respecting each other's livelihoods, and where there are transgressions, this is the part that will follow. So a lot of this is really um, the beginning stage will be the dialogue, but all of these elements that I've mentioned um, would should, would be followed. I know that um, there, there is this uh, peace uh, body, like you said, I've forgotten the name that was institutionalized. I don't know why the current government abandoned it. It's perhaps they should consider revisiting that, that peace uh, mm. body so that all of these elements that I've mentioned may be uh, pursued by them. Mm. So, I mean, this recent attacks have increased the call for the establishment of state or community policing. What's your view? Um, so yes, you, I, I, I referred to this when I was mentioning the things that I think the um, Speaker of the House of Rep can do. Uh, there is um, in this rising demand for state policing. Um, I think the, given the level of, um, uh, you know, the dirt, dirt of policing in Nigeria, we need to revamp our policing ap approach. Now, if state policing is what we've agreed to pursue, what are the safeguards that we're going to put in place to reduce or eliminate the possibility of the state governors hijacking? But I think that's the most cogent concern. I, I used to have that concern until I recently met um, someone who um, introduced to me elements of safeguard um, that can be em embedded into the state policing system to reduce uh, the governors from hijacking them and using them for political purposes or to achieve objectives that will put, um, you know, hurt our national existence. Um, some of us have haven't forgotten what happened in 1967 that led to the Civil War. And so we're going to go that route, which I think we're right for, uh, what remains is for us as a country to come up with safeguard measures. And I can tell you some of the safeguard measures. We need to strengthen democracy at the state level, um, the legislative arm of government at the state level, the judicial arm of government at the state level should have their voice. At the moment, most of the states, um, those two arms don't have their voice. They are more or less in the pocket of, of the governor. Mm -hmm. So imagine a situation where the governor also has the control of the monopoly of the use of force at the state. Uh, what would happen? Um, other safeguards can also include at the federal level where, for instance, there will be a checklist and there will be an evaluation periodically. Um, so it will be licenses issued to the state with clear um, jurisdictional mandates. And where those checklists are evaluated and there are failures, then that licenses can be withdrawn, as an example. So I am very supportive of um, um, state policing, but with um, safeguards to prevent their you know, usage in the manner that led to the civil war in 1967. Uh, absolutely. Now, as we wrap up tonight, let's talk about care for survivors and those displaced. What do you think is the best way to care for them? Um, number one is to document them. And again, this is important that on both sides, um, not documented in one side and ignoring the other. It must be on both sides. Uh, and then, of course, um, what the state government can do. The development partners are doing amazingly well. And I think Borno State has a model that perhaps states like Plateau State can also grow from come up with a plan where they, do, they document development partners that are happy to support them. And then, of course, the federal government should also come, come in and, and help uh, cater to their needs. There are immediate needs, and then there are also long-term long needs, uh, resettling them. Um, but beyond that, and, and this is one of the reasons why I find uh, the very simplistic explanation that is, this is resource based quite um, you know, amazing. Uh, if it's resource based and we think it's driven by land, what is stopping the state government from issuing our titles of land to the people? 
do that at least uh, if you have a title that is um, you know sanctioned and uh, endorsed by the government whether you've been chased out of that land you have an element to say this is your land and even if somebody comes to settle in, in it tomorrow you can go back and show evidence that 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 is your land so i, I again i think um governance uh, has a lot of responsibility in, in this element um several states in the federation came up with this geographical information system where they use technology to come up with systems for titling lands. I'm not sure where Plati State is in that regard. Right, so quickly before I let you go, what's your advice to the federal government on the lasting way to secure Nigeria? Um, so, number one, it's let's respect the provisions of the Constitution. There are um, certain... Um, you know, uh, hierarchies and elements within our constitution. Uh, an example is the several councils, the National Defense Council, the National Security Council, the National Police Council. Um, that security provision, the architecture that, people, that we use consistently, it's there. Uh, people say we use architecture without really understanding what, what, it, what it means. Some of us actually know what it means. There are councils within the security architecture. Those councils are there for a purpose. They are meant to sit and discuss and agree decisions. Um, the, those that are behind the framing of our constitution, when they put those councils, there was a reason why they put them. Now, let's start with respecting the provisions of the constitution and start oh. convening those councils as made necessary. So that's number one. Number two, let's introduce accountability within the security management, public security management system, where mandates are not respected, mm. where killings occur, somebody should be held accountable. Mm. Now that holding accountable could mean just suspension. It could mean in some instances... Dr. Adamu, sadly, sadly we're out of time. I'm sure we will continue this conversation some more time. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I've been speaking with Dr. Kabiru Adamu, a security expert, managing director of Beacon Consulting Limited. So now to focus on the continued killings in plant State. Thank you so much for joining us, no, sir. Always a pleasure having you on Politics tonight. Please have a great weekend. And you, the pleasure is mine.